Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering part two of schizophrenia. If you haven't watched part one yet, I suggest you watch part one first because um, I, in part one, I go over exactly what schizophrenia is. I go over very important clinical manifestations. Now in part two, I'm going to be continuing with those clinical manifestations, but we're also going to add nursing interventions onto them as well. And of course, um, assessment tools. So before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you guys to please support me, support my channel. How can you do that? Like this video, subscribe to my channel. If you haven't done so already, share my content, share my content on your social media profile, on your Facebook or your Instagram, or share it with a classmate, a colleague, uh, a nursing instructor. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, so let's get started. Self-assessment, look what it says. Most people with schizophrenia often experience anaso you guys know I can't pronounce anasog <gasps> anasognosia and inability to realize they're ill and that's caused by the illness itself. And I wrote what did I write here? I wrote the goal of treatment is for them to realize that they're hallucinating because a big problem with these patients who are schizophrenic. Even though you try to tell them what they're hearing or what they're seeing does not exist, part of their disease is not believing it, okay? They do not realize that they actually have an illness. So part of the treatment for these patients is to help them realize those voices that they're hearing are not real, right? Or those visual hallucinations that they're seeing are not real. That is part of the treatment plan, very important schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Look at some very important uh, assessment guidelines. Number one, ensure the patient has had a medical workup. Why? We need to see if there are any comorbidities going on that we're going to have to address. And number two, sometimes a uh, patient may have been diagnosed with a certain disorder, but then as we're doing the assessment, because remember assessment is not only physically looking at your patient, it's not only a physical examination, assessment is also gathering information, asking questions. And we may find out that, you know, the patient may be on a certain medication, they have a toxic level in their body, right? And that's mimicking those same clinical manifestations that we see in a schizophrenia that may make it worse. So it's very important to do a full medical workup assess for indications of medical problems that may mimic that may mimic psychosis such as digitalis or too too much anticholinergics in the body brain trauma drug intoxication delirium and fever remember with delirium guys delirium is reversible where dementia is not with delirium the patient will have short term memory issues or short term they may be out of touch with reality, but it's only short term because there's an underlying cause. But once that underlying cause is fixed, you know, their cognition has improved. So that's a big difference between delirium and dementia, but delirium may be a reason that we are seeing these clinical manifestations. So the patient does need to be assessed for these. We're going to assess them for substance or alcohol use disorders. Why? Substance disorders and alcohol use disorders, those are com comorbidities that we see very often in the patients that are schizophrenic. We're going to do a, men a mini mental exam on the patient. We're going to assess for hallucinations. And look what it says. Do not imply that the perceptions are real. So you do not say to the patient, um... What are the voices saying? Because when you say, what are the voices saying? You're giving credence to what they're saying about those voices. Okay, so look what it says. It says, ask, what do you hear? Not, what are the voices saying to you? And the reason say, what do you hear? Because guess what? You hear those voices. I don't hear those voices. No one else hears those voices. You hear those voices. Do you guys see the difference? That's very important. Assess for delusions. Remember, delusions is having a false belief, believing something that is just not true. Even in the presence of proof that your belief isn't true and you still believe it, that is a delusion. So you're gonna assess the patient for delusions. If present, are they firmly held? Is the patient able to test the um, to reality test? Assess for suicide risk. 
When you're assessing for suicide risk, you have to be direct. This is not one of the things we, um, what is the saying? Hide around the bush, move around the bush. You know, you know what I mean? Something like that. You have to ask the patient directly. Are you having thoughts of harming yourself or someone else? You ask them directly because many times patients who are suicidal or they have suicidal thoughts, they want to tell someone but no one has ever asked them directly. When it comes to suicide, when it comes to abuse, you always ask them directly. So if the patient says, yes, I'm having thoughts of harming myself, the very next thing you ask them is how. You wanna find out, do they have a plan? And you wanna know how lethal that plan is. So the second thing you do is ask them how. And the third question you ask them is if they have access to the mode or the vehicle of um following through with that plan. So for example, if they say they plan on shooting themselves in the head, the third question is, do you have a gun? All right. So do you have plans on harming yourself? What is your plan? And do you have access to that weapon of however you plan on harming yourself? Very important. Number nine, assess for ability to ensure safety and health. Maintain adequate food and fluid intake. This is important, guys. Remember when it comes to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our priority is always going to be what falls under physiological integrity. That means what is going to keep that patient alive. Nutrition, fluid and electrolytes, those vital signs, hemodynamic status, right? All of those will keep that patient alive. So always our priority is going to be what is physically keeping that patient alive. So look at this, food, fluid intake, rest, sleep. We're going to make sure are they um, be able to care for themselves. Look at number 10. You're going to assess the prescribed medications, all of the medications that they're on, whether they take their medications the way they're supposed to or not, how often they're taking those medications, how often those medications are. That's important. How many times have we seen this when I was doing part one? Huh? positive and negative symptoms. Did I not tell you that I guarantee you're going to at least get two test questions. If you're taking psych or mental health right now, I guarantee you, you will at least get one to two questions alone on positive versus negative symptoms. You have to know it. You can't run away from them. So I suggest you make index cards, whatever you got to do to make sure you know the difference. But again, positive symptoms of schizophrenia are symptoms that the patient has, but they shouldn't. Negative symptoms of schizophrenia are things that the patient does not have, but they should. So let's look at these positive symptoms, things that they have that they should not have. Hearing voices. Um, having loose association of ideas, con conversation, that's de de <clears throat> conversation that is derailed, right? Negative symptoms. Negative symptoms is not having something that you should. Negative symptoms is the lack of something, right? Such as uncommunicative. You should be communicative, right? Affective. You should have affect. Flattening. Um, showing lack of energy. That's the energia. Shows lack of motivation. Avolition. Um, let's see. Part one has those, um, the six A's of the negative symptoms. Go make sure you guys know those six A's. They're not all in here, but go back to a uh, part one and make sure you know those because most likely when it comes to test questions, if it's a negative symptom, it's going to be one of those, right? A, remember when A's in front of the word, that's without. Let's look at this care plan. Additional nursing interventions, not care plans, sorry guys, nursing interventions for the patient that is experiencing psychosis. So what is psychosis? Psychosis is when someone is out of touch with reality. That is psychosis. So we're going to go over the different problems, um, considerations, important nursing interventions or nursing care for that patient. So poor hygiene, that patient that's schizophrenic, that's hearing voices or they're having visual uh, hallucinations, 
they are so focused on that hallucination and what they're hearing or seeing or what they're saying, they're really not caring for themselves. We tend to see a lack of hygiene in that schizophrenic patient. Look at the considerations. Contributing factors, apathy, where they just don't care. They Abolition, negativism, disorganized thinking, they're distracted easily, right? Nursing care, concisely and explicitly identify expected hygiene. You have to be very clear that it's expected that they brush their teeth every morning. It's expected that they take a shower once a day. You have to be very um, clear and explicit in your expectations. Look at number three. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys. Use visual cues to prop attention to hygiene tasks. Remember, guys, they get distracted very easily. So an example is um, putting toothbrush and towels in the bathroom and clean clothes on the bed. Guess what that means? I expect you to brush your teeth and take a shower, right? You may have to give them uh, direction step by step. I need you to pick up your toothbrush. I need you to put toothpaste on your toothbrush. I need you to brush your teeth. Number six, periodically remind patient and refocus to hygiene tasks as needed. Why? They get distracted very easily. So it's very important that you have to refocus them. All right. Next problem, resistance to treatment, non-adherence. Remember guys that adoxog, that word I cannot pronounce, anosognosia, right? That's when they don't even think they have a problem. That causes them to not want to be compliant. Look at what it says. This word, you see it, causes treatment to seem illogical. Why do I have to do this? I don't have a problem. Side effects, stigma, inconvenience, a belief that the treatment will not help, maybe it's expensive, impaired memory, and mistrust of the prescriber also discourages that patient from being compliant. Remember, as I said in part one, patients who are um, schizophrenic, they are very distrustful, and it's very likely they will be distrustful of you, the nurse. So what are some nursing interventions? Number one, don't be judgmental. Treat them with respect. Number two, you want to establish trust, right? Don't ever lie to your patient. Be as honest as possible as you can. And if you tell them, I'm, I'll be back in five minutes, even if you get busy, you better go back there in five minutes just to tell them, hey, I'm going to be a little bit longer, but I'll give me another 10 minutes. But make sure you keep your word. You have to establish trust. Checking excuse me, checking, cheeking or palming medication. So that's part of the patient being non-compliant. You give them the medication and they hide it in their cheek or they hide it in their hands. They don't take their medication. Number one, address the underlying reasons for wanting to avoid medications. That's what? An assessment. That's the first part of the ADPI assessment. Ask questions. Find out what their concern is because you can't help that patient. You can't teach them until you even know what they're thinking in their mind. Agnesonomia, I, I, <laughs> you guys see this word, I can't pronounce it, but this word, that means they don't think they have a problem. Nursing care, again, establish a trusting relationship because they won't believe you that they have a problem unless they actually trust you. So that's the first thing you guys need to do. Them avoiding interaction with peers. Remember, they're very distrustful. They don't want to be around people. What can you do? Actively convey acceptance. Don't force them. Convey acceptance and meet the patient where they are now. Why? Because you have to establish that trust first. Regularly engage with the patient. And that might be them being in their room and you just sitting in the chair in their room. Not even saying a word. That's uh, still therapeutic communication using silence. You're offering self. You're letting that patient know you're so important. I'm just going to sit here in case you want to talk. How about for depression, hopelessness, despair? Engage in connecting regularly with the patient. 
talk to them, ask them questions. When you talk to them and you ask them questions, what you're conveying to them is that you're important. I care. That's why I want to know about you. That's why I'm asking these questions. That's why I'm reaching out to you. So that depression, that hopelessness that they have, it may be lifted just a little bit to know that one person cares. Uh, teach activities to reduce depression. What are those activities? Physical activity, just going for a walk, self-nurturing, such as taking a relaxing bath or listening to uplifting music, seeking support from others, spending more time outside if possible. What else? Poor self-esteem. You can actively convey unconditional acceptance. Help the patient recognize positive traits or accomplishments. And this is important. Um, on the unit, everybody will have a job or a chore that's assigned to them. And maybe your patient is washing the dishes. Just you saying to that patient, wow, you did a really good job washing the dishes. It means a lot. It means a lot. So, you know, you want to point out positive traits that the patient does and accomplishments, no matter how small in your eyes that accomplishment is, it's something big to them, okay? Next, fall risk, I'm down here, fall risk. So you're gonna assess their gait, and after you assess the gait, as the RN, you may be the one, if you know, you're assessing the patient's gait and you realize, you know, that patient's not so st sturdy, you are, are the one who is responsible for calling the healthcare provider and say, hey, can I get an order for a physical therapy evaluation, right? Or occupational therapy evaluation, depending on what you see. You're going to assess them for orthostatic hypotension. You're going to take their blood pressure standing, sitting, lying down. And if you note that that blood pressure drops with um, change of body position, you're going to teach them to do what? Change position slowly, change slowly from a lying to sitting or sitting to standing or lying to standing because we don't want that blood pressure to drop abruptly and for that patient to be on the ground. We're going to teach them safety measures such as using handrails, such as not having um, slippery throw rugs or any throw rugs, teaching them to make sure that they don't have any um, cords on the ground that they can trip over. Make sure that there's good lighting. Choking risk. Again, always assess. You're going to assess the patient for any difficulty swallowing. You, the RN, you notice any deficiencies. You may have to call the healthcare provider and say, hey, you know, I notice X, Y, Z. Can we get an order for a speech evaluation? Because with that speech evaluation, they do what? A swallow study. Okay. With dry mouth, taking a sip of a beverage with each bite can make swallowing easier. So you can teach that to the patient, teach them to take smaller bites, teach them to eat more slowly. For restlessness and agitation, teach them to reduce excess stimuli. How can we do that? Dim the lights, lower the volume on the TV or the radio. Redirect the patient to less stimulating areas or activities. They don't need to be right there next to the nurse's station where healthcare providers are giving orders. The nurses are giving report. Family members are complaining about whatever it is they're complaining about, right? So you want to get them away from all that excess stimulation if they do have a restlessness or agitation. Risk for other directed violence. Assess that patient for paranoid, th paranoid thoughts, command hallucinations. Remember how dangerous command hallucinations are. I talked about that in um, part one. Okay. You have to assess them for that. Impaired impulse control, increasing tension. You have to see, check them to see if their agitation is increasing. If they start pacing or they start doing this or their body language changes to being more aggressive. You have to watch out for that. Teach and guide the patient to practice coping skills to reduce stress and desperation. Provide constructive diversion and outlets for physical energy. There may be a room with a whole bunch of punching bags. I don't know what you call them. What do you call them? Bean, 
they're not called bean bags, but you know what I'm talking about. Those bags that the boxers use to practice, you know, if they have all this pent up energy, if you could take them to one of those rooms where they can just punch that punching bag, or maybe that's what it's called, a punching bag. Or um, if there's an exercise room, let them get on the treadmill, treadmill and get rid of all that excess energy. It's better than them punching somebody else, right? Only when truly necessary, only when truly necessary, use seclusion and or chemical medication or physical restraint. That is our last uh, um, nursing intervention that we want to do. Okay. And you know, when you use, let me tell you, you see seclusion. So we try to deescalate. It's not working. We're going to take the patient. We're like, let's go out for a walk. It doesn't work. They're trying to beat up the people walking on the sidewalk. We put them in the room and we close that door or we give them an injection of Ativan. We give them a chemical medication. We save that for last and you better have a doctor's order. You do it, you better get covered immediately. Well, you can't do it first. You better have a doctor's order, okay? I say doctor, but I mean healthcare provider because it could be a nurse practitioner. It could be a physician assistant. You understand what I'm saying? Assess for risk to self. Again, are you having any thoughts of harming yourself or someone else? They say yes. Do you have a plan? What is that plan? Do you have access to that weapon in that order? Provide increased supervision when risk is present. Placing the patient in a room near the nurse's station can facilitate monitoring. And that's for patients who have risk for self-directed violence. Guess what? If they have risk for self-directed violence, we don't leave them alone. We have to have our eye on them all the time. Make rounds or checks at predictable intervals, such as every 15 minutes to provide the patient with a window of opportunity. Preferably rounds should be at unpredictable intervals and adjusted based on risk. So let me explain this to you. Um, if you make your rounds and you're predictable, you, you know, you make your rounds at the same time every single day, they are not idiots. If they really want to harm themselves or even harm someone else, they know when you're coming to do your check so they can time it perfectly, right? So you need to do your rounds and be unpredictable with it. So it keeps them on their toes and they're less likely to try to follow through with that plan of harming themselves or someone else. Ensure that the patient is taking their medications as ordered, that they're not pocketing that medication, they're not cheeking that medication, they're not palming that medication. Extra precautions should be taken to assure that the patient has not acquired a weapon. You have to check their things, check their purse, look under the mattress, look in the closet, make sure they're not hiding a knife or a gun or you know anything that they can harm themselves or someone else with. Helping patients who are experiencing hallucinations, nursing care. I don't know if you guys noticed this yet, but if you're still in school and you're taking these tests, don't you notice that about 75% of your questions are really nursing interventions? Think about it, guys. We are preparing you to take go take your boards. Guess what the boards care about? What you're going to do? As a test writer for NCLEX, I want to make sure that you're not going to go out there and kill my husband or my child or my aunt or my mother or whoever, someone that, that I love. So most of your questions are going to be nursing interventions. What are you going to do? What are you not going to do? What are you going to do but do first? Right? So let's look at nursing care for the patient who's experiencing hallucinations. Watch the patient for hallucinating cues. What are those cues? And that's important. You guys need to know what those cues are. Tracking an unheard speaker. So you're looking at your patient. You see them doing this. Their eyes are following nothing. You see absolutely nothing. Uh-oh. Them muttering are talking to themselves. Who are they talking to? Appearing distracted. How are you distracted? No one's there. Suddenly stopping conversations is if inter interrupted. So they're speaking and all of a sudden they stop. They stop because they heard a voice or they saw something that's not really there. Or intently watching a vacant, that means empty. Intently, intently watching an empty 
area of the room. What are they seeing that nobody else is seeing? You better assess that patient. Assess for command hallucinations. In part one, I talked about how dangerous that is, guys. When the patient has command hallucinations, they feel compelled to do whatever the voices tell them to do. They can't help it. They may love you as a nurse. You are their favorite nurse. But if they hear that voice tell them to punch you in the throat, guess what? You get punched in the throat unless you're able to dodge it very quickly. Command hallucinations are, are um, very dangerous. If that patient's standing next to a window and the voice tells them to jump out, they feel compelled to jump out. Three, avoid referring to the hallucinations as if they're real. Do not ask, what are the voices saying to you? Because when you say, what are the voices, you're giving the voices reality. No, you say, what are you hearing? And the reason you say, what are you hearing? Because I don't hear it and, and no one else in the room hears it. What are you hearing? Big difference. Make sure you know that. Number five, do not negate the patient's experience, but offer your own perceptions and convey empathy. So the thing is, you don't want to put it on them because they're going to get defensive. So you don't want to say to them, you're not hearing voices. You're going to get into a power struggle and you're putting all, you're shifting all of that just horrible energy on them. You don't want to do that. Put it on you. Say, I don't hear anything. I don't see anyone. You see the difference? Number six, focus on reality-based here and now. Okay. P focus on reality-based here and now activities such as conversations or simple projects. Tell the patient, the voice you hear is part of your illness and it cannot hurt you. Number eight, Promote and guide reality testing. Remember part one, I talked about reality testing, how, you know, sometimes at nighttime, maybe you're by yourself and you thought you heard a noise and you listen and you're like, okay, I didn't hear anything. You are testing your reality when you do that. Promote and guide reality testing. If the patient has frightening hallucinations, guide him or her to scan the area to see if others appear frightened. And if they're not, encourage the patient to consider that these might be hallucinations. Why are you the only one that is seeing this person or hearing this voice? Look around you. You're going to say kindly though. You're going to have them look around them. And is there anybody else that, that is looking scared or is paying attention to this invisible person? No. Help them test their own reality. You're going to teach a patient to manage stress or stimulation, stress and stimulation, I should say. Avoid overly loud or stressful places or activities. So this patient's already having hallucinations. Do you think they need increased stimuli? Absolutely not. I'm not going to go over all of these guys. I'm just going over the ones that I tend to see show up more on nursing tests, but make sure you guys know all of them. I don't write your exams. Um, Two, use other sounds that compete with hallucinations. We talked about that in part one. This is sound This is uh, called um, competing auditory stimuli. When they hear those voices, teach them. You hear those voices, drown them out. Turn on the radio and the song that you like, put it up. Drown out those sounds. Competing auditory stimuli. Teach them to talk with others. Listen to music or watch TV, but not too loudly. Read aloud, sing, whistle, hum. And last, for this video, helping patients who are experiencing delusions. Remember, delusions are false thoughts. These are thoughts the patient has that even when they have proof, to the contrary, they still have that belief, okay? Those are delusions. So you want to build trust by being open, honest, genuine, reliable. Ask the patient to describe his beliefs, such as, tell me more about someone trying to hurt you. Listen to them because the more that you're hearing and the more that they talk, that is the more information that you're getting. So you can kind of help them test their reality. Never, never debate the delusional content. Do not enter into power struggles with the patient. Supportively convey doubt when appropriate. For example, although this is frightening for you, it seems as if it would be hard for a girl that small to hurt you. 
You see the difference? And validate if part of the delusion is real. For example, yes, there was a man at the nurse's station, but I didn't hear him talk about you. So if part of the delusion is real, address that. And you're also, when you're doing that, you're helping that patient really address and test their reality as well. And it builds trust because it's not like you're gaslighting them saying, oh, you're, you know, you're just delusional. You know, everything you're saying is not true. No. Yeah, there was a person there, but I didn't hear them say one word about you. All right, guys, that is the end for part two. Um, starting with part three, the next video, I'm going to actually start going over the pharmacology portion of schizophrenia and these antipsychotic medications that are very important in schizophrenia. You guys absolutely need to know. So watch out for part three. Please let me know what you guys thought about this video in the comment section. Let me know about anything you guys would like to see me cover that I haven't done so already. Please don't forget I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And you guys can catch me covering a variety of nursing content on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So be sure to check me out there. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.